On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear it to dark Calvary So Awesome, awesome. How are we all doing this morning? You doing good? Ready to celebrate Easter? This has been a great weekend. We had a great Friday, uh, Good Friday service. We had a great service yesterday. The first service this morning was awesome. So you're in for a treat. I am glad you guys are all here. Are we excited this morning? Uh, yeah. So it's been a good weekend besides here. I mean, how many watched the Blues last night? Was that awesome? You know, kind of funny. My son in law uh, was talking before game five. He was just, he's like, man, we need to get rid of that Schwartz guy. He's just is not doing anything. And he scores a game winner in three. So after he scored his third goal yesterday, my son-in-law was watching the game over at his family's house. And I texted him and said, that Schwartz, he really stinks, doesn't he? So it's all right. He's still my favorite son-in-law. So, um, but anyway, I'm Herc Noblet, one of the pastors here. This would be? My name is Laura Campbell. Laura, you got some announcements for us? Yes, so if you're a guest here with us today, we'd like to say welcome. We're so glad you want to spend your Easter here with us. Um, first off, you'll notice that we don't take an offering in this service. Um, we just want you to sit back, relax, and let this service be our gift to you. However, if you do call Oak Ridge your home, there are joy boxes throughout the campus, as well as online giving and text giving, and we just ask that you give with a grateful heart. And um, next, you'll notice that we don't take communion in the service. Um, there's a room right behind me called the Reflection Room. You can go and do that. There's people in there that you can pray with, um, and you can do that after service. Great. And then you've got a little brochure. What's that all about? Yes. So um, if you're a guest, you're going to want to go to the information center. It's right outside these doors. Um, and you're going to pick up a new guest brochure. Inside, it's going to tell you some information about our church and what we believe in. And then also, there's two free coupons, one for a free drink from our cafe and one for a free T-shirt for you. So they can go and take the T-shirt and go into the Connect room, find out more information about the church if they want, and grab a T-shirt there. So people that are here that are visiting, I mean, they get like a whole new wardrobe this morning because yeah. we're also giving to everybody that's in attendance today one of these T-shirts that say four, yeah. right? So there's four different stations out there, and there's actually youth sizes as well. So everybody after the service can, can grab one of those, right? Yeah. Is, are that the shirts they're supposed to say about the golf tournament this year? We they were, spelled it wrong? 
Uh-huh. Yeah, I think they missed that. Nobody got that. No, yeah. You hear what she said? They were supposed to give out the golf tournament, but they spelled four wrong. You know, so, so. I said it last night, and people laughed. So yeah. we got a cricket sound for her. Um, yeah, so I'm just kidding you. So just a few announcements. One, if you're in here and you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, the time for sign-ups for summer programs for big stuff, it, at the end of this week, it goes up uh, it goes up like 50 or 60 bucks. So you need to sign up. The summer programs, the deadline is approaching because we got to make the plans for the trips and all those kind of things. So get online, do that. If you're not sure where the link is, then you can text SUMMER to 636-333. 3340, and it'll give you a right to the link, so encourage you to do that. And then also, um, next week, again, if, you, if you're new here and just want to know why we do the things we do, a little bit about the history of the church, find out how you can get involved next week after the second service from 1230 to 2, we're going to have an, an Explore Oak Bridge luncheon. So we'll give you a free lunch, and you get a free t-shirt this week, free lunch next week. I think Tom's giving out like cars or something, you know, in three weeks or so. So, um, But sign up for that. Go into the Connect room today. Let them know that you'd, you'd like to sign up for that, and you can meet some people and, and do all that. Are we missing anything else? So. Nothing. No? We have a great service. I'm telling you, the music is powerful. The message is great. So why don't we stand up, say hello to somebody around us, and let's get excited to worship our God.
Awesome. Thank you, guys. You can go ahead and take a seat. I, I love that line, you know, that he just, the tomb was borrowed for three days and our God robbed the grave. What an amazing weekend this has been, just to remind me of, of just the massive love that our God has for us. And, and you know, we've got an amazing Savior. It says that Jesus came full of truth and grace. And we're going to learn together now a new song. And this is kind of a unique song. It's a powerful song. It's been huge for the last two services. But this is a responsorial song. So you guys have a part to play in this. And I know it's new and you're going to be learning it, but it's going to ask some questions. And we respond by singing, we do, or it is, or, or he does. And as you catch on, I hope you sing the rest of it as well. But, but I love this song because like our Savior, it is filled with grace and truth. Basically, it asks the question and it says, is this world messed up? Are things maybe not the way that they're supposed to be? And I think we, we would have to say by looking around sometimes, absolutely, yes, it is messed up. But then it goes on and it gives us, it gives us the story of grace and mercy and along with this truth that, that there is a God who is in the midst of the mess and he is able to fix it and to clean it up and he's coming back. And in the meantime, he doesn't leave us as orphans. He still, through his spirit, guides and directs us. So a great and powerful song, but it's based upon a passage of scripture from Revelation chapter 5. And Revelation was a book that was written by the Apostle John, who might have been one of Jesus' best friends, and, and uh, probably written during a time of great persecution. And there's a, a scene, and, and he uses vivid imagery, and it's a little bit of strange language, but basically it's the story of Jesus that, that he wins, and that he's able, and, and that he is able to fix things. But there's a scene where basically there's an angel and an angel is in heaven, and John is, is, is seeing this, and, and the angel is saying, you know, is there anyone that is able to fix things? Is there anyone that is able to bring in justice? Is there anyone that is able to, to, to bring about righteousness? And, and the Apostle John, I'll, I'll just start reading, but the Apostle John is wondering, this question is weeping, and this passage, I think, will bring much more meaning to the song as we sing it. It says this in Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And this is John speaking. He says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. But then one of the elders came up to John and said, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then it goes on down, and it says, As they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And you know, it's an amazing passage. This is an amazing song. But, but this song, I think, really demands decisions from us. So as we sing it, I hope we enjoy the lyrics and the truths that, that come from this passage. But, but also, you know, we can't be neutral on this subject. I mean, we, all weekend long, we've celebrated the fact that, that God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus that was the lamb who was slain, that he died on the cross, a death that we owed, that we should have paid, took, took our sin and gave us his righteousness. And then with a huge exclamation point, he robbed the grave. He conquered sin and death and rose from the dead. And, and his followers or maybe people, we got to decide, do we really believe that? And see, we do. We believe that this was an actual event that happened in history 2,000 years ago. And again, you can't be fence sitters with this. It makes all the difference in the world. So if you really believe it, if you really believe it, then what, does it, what is it doing to you? How is it changing you? What are you, what are you doing for the king? Are you part of, of ushering in what's going on up there and bringing it down to earth? Because that's what this, this song is all about. Yeah, there's problems. And maybe in your life you're going through a tough situation, but the king is able. 
The lamb who was slain has conquered sin and death on our behalf, and we can be a part of that. So this is a great time of worship, a great time of reflection, a great time of challenge and decision as we sing this new song together.
Lion of Judah that conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue He has made us a kingdom and priests to God To reign with the Son Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Those are like wow songs, aren't they? I mean, what a God we serve. Why don't you just go to him in prayer on your own for a few moments? Father in heaven, I, I think it's clear. If we really believe the, the lyrics that we've sung over the last 15 or 20 minutes, it's clear that, that he is worthy. Father, all we can really do is just respond in awe and wonder and amazement and, and just fall to our knees in worship and thanks. Father, we offer our lives, hopefully, as living sacrifices to you. And while we can never repay the debt, Father, we can be the kingdom of that you want us to be. We can be the priest, all of us who believe that you want us to be to point people towards your son, Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls. We just are eternally grateful. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys go and take a seat. Well, good morning. My name's Tom. I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Bridge. I uh, wanted to first of all say hello to Oak Bridge City. This is the first Easter. Where we're one church with two campuses. So uh, they're watching along with us right now. So why don't you give them a round of Oak Bridge City? If you live close to the city, they'd love to have you there. Uh, the next thing I'd like to say is on our online people. There's a few hundred people every week that watch online. So I'd like to say hello to you. Then any others that are in the foyer or in the overflow room, uh, welcome uh, today. Um, I want to tell you something, first of all, about Easter. I, I'm not one guy that believes that, the, that uh, I'm going to talk about the what of Easter. Let me explain that to you. The what is, is that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose from the grave. I think almost everybody knows that. In 30 some odd years of being a Christian, I've only ran into one, maybe two people that had never heard that story. And if you're in here today and you say, well, I don't know the story of Easter, just elbow somebody after service. And, and there's hundreds, if not thousands of people around this area right now that can tell you. Uh, the what. I want, to, I want to know the why. I want to know the why. I got a lot of friends, a lot of people that I run into, they know the what of Easter. They know about Jesus, that he lived, he died, he rose. Whether they believe it or not, or whether they understand why he came or not, that's a whole different category. So uh, today we're going to talk about the why, and I'm going to just even level it out a little bit more. I think when you understand this why, it might be why some of you have rejected God. It might be why some of you have never thought about God. It might be why some of you thought, I don't, why do I need this God? Why do I need this anchor around me? That's what some, some people think. And I think if, if you stand around this long enough and hear this why, I think God might touch something inside of you that maybe you didn't know it existed. And he might say, hey, look, that's true. That's true. 
So uh, that's kind of where we're going today. This new series is called Four. In about 30 minutes, you'll know exactly what this T-shirt means and what it represents. And I'd been wanting to preach this series for about a year, year and a half. I'd been thinking heavily about this subject, and, and, and you'll understand in about 30 minutes why I'm thinking about it. And I thought, you know what, let's, let's debut it on Easter of 2019, and we're going to stay in this topic for about the next eight weeks. And if you call Oak Bridge your home, we're going to be talking about this very heavily in, in multifacets for the next two years. That's how important I think this message is for everybody here in this room, everybody watching online, and in this generation. So here's where this scripture came out of, at least the thinking of this. It's Romans 12, 2. Paul, Apostle Paul writes this letter to a group of people in Rome that were believers. Here's what he writes. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I, the term approve is key. You'll be able to prove what God's will is for you. I mean, it's not, okay, God, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give in to your will. You'll approve. I mean, you say, yeah, that, that's the will I want. That's what I want for me. That's what I want to know about you, God. That's what I want to know. You'll, you'll approve it. So that's where we're going for the next eight weeks if you choose to come, to try and renew our minds a little bit, to try and get the fog out of it, and to test and approve what God's will is. Sometimes our thinking about God gets foggy. And what I mean by foggy is we think God is like this when he's really not. Or we think God is this way when he's really never been this way. But yet we think it to be true. And I'll give you an example of when my thinking about God gets foggy. Uh, it comes to sports. Here's kind of what I do with God the other, the other day in the Blues games. I'm going like this. I'm saying, okay, God, I really want the Blues to win. I hope you want the Blues to win. If you let the Blues win, if you let them score, then tomorrow morning I'll read the Bible for 10 minutes more, right? As if I'm thinking, okay, God, if I do this, it, will you do this for me, right? That's, that's foggy thinking that, God, uh, I'll do this. Here's another one. This Masters golf tournament that was just a couple weeks ago. You know Josh. You guys all know Josh, the guy that wears the funny clothing. Anyway, he, he preaches up here now and then, and uh, he's at Oak Ridge City, the campus pastor there. Well, he started a golf pool. So don't judge me, don't get mad at me right now. He started a golf pool, and you put in 20 bucks, you picked like eight golfers, whatever their total score was at the end of the tournament, then you won. And the, and the pot was like 500 bucks for the winner, and like 800 bucks for second, and like 50 bucks for third, whatever it came to. Well, this whole tournament, I was right near the top. I was second the whole time. So on the last day of the Masters tournament, I know I'm one putt behind. So I'm praying. I said, God, if you just let Tiger Woods miss this putt, so if, you, if you just let him miss this putt, I promise you, I'll give 50 bucks back to the church. Now, I want you to imagine this for a second. You've you got to imagine it, right? God's up in heaven. He looks at Jesus and says, can you believe this guy? He looks at the Holy Spirit and says, get this. He thinks that he's going to make our day by praying for 20 more minutes or reading the Bible for 20 more minutes. Can you believe this? Like, our day depends on Tom. Can you believe this one? He's going to give a little bit more money. Does he know I own the cattle on a thousand hills? Does he know that the biggest diamond made, the man is like that big? I can make a planet out of diamonds. What is he thinking? And you know what? That's where it gets fuzzy. You think that if I bargain with God, if I do that, does God need anything from us? Think about that. He hung the stars in the heaven. He created all the plants. He created all... You think he needs anything from Tom, from me? No, there's nothing he needs from me but yet you get foggy and you think, well, God does need something from me. You do think that a little bit. Uh, so here's the point. I can get real foggy, one of them, is when I think God wants something from me. God, you want this from me. I know if I give you this, I'll do that. I'll do this. That's what God wants. He wants something from me. Have you guys ever bartered with God? Ever bartered with God? Now, if you say no, then you're going to be surprised here in a second. You ever think that, you know, if I do this, God will do that? How about any of you guys that ever ask for a job? Well, if I just get that job, God, if I get that job, then here's what I'll do for you. Now, how about this one? If you say you're young, you've never bartered with God. You ever prayed for an A on a test that you didn't study for? Well, you know, if you just let me know the answers now, God, I, I won't, you know, I'll treat my sister better. And for, for a lot of us, you ever hope that the little strip didn't go a certain color? Well, God, if I'm not, I'll never do right? I mean, we barter with God, and it's foggy theology. I mean, there's nothing you can give God. 
He's not looking for your behavior. He's not looking for your money. He's not looking for uh, your prayer time. That's not, there, we, we can't give God anything, reality. He's not asking for anything from us. I believe this is the why behind Easter. The what? Jesus came, lived, died. You can believe that. I believe it. You can get through that. You've heard that story. But the why? Why, why was it 2,000 years ago that Jesus came? Why not 3,000? Why not 4,000? Why did he not wait until come till you know the, the year 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,800? Why 2,000 years ago? And here's kind of a little bit where I land on that. And you're going to have to use your imagination again. This is Tom thinking about it. 2,000 years ago when Christ came, for 400 years before that time period, God was silent. 400 years before that time period, he used to speak through prophets and people that he would, they would be direct revelation to God. But for 400 years, he went silent. I don't really know why. So 400 years before, 2,000 years ago, he was silent. And I think God tells Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I think here's what he does. I think he said, we got a problem. We got a problem. You know, the people down there, they think something. And here's what I think. I think they think that I'm against them. I think they think because they haven't heard from 400 years. I think they think that I'm against them. Jesus says, you think? Yeah, I think that's what I think. Holy Spirit, you think yet? I think that's what I think. I think people think, my creation thinks, that I'm against them. And he said, Jesus, we've got to do something about that. You've got to go down there and show them something different. It's your time to clear their mind, to show them their good, pleasing, and approving will, to show what I'm, I'm good for them, I'm for them. And here's why I believe it. These are, I could put out more, but for time's sake, there's three glimpses that we get to look into the Bible. Three glimpses that would show why, they, why God would have said, Jesus, you've got to go now. All the world thinks I'm against them. And here's the three. I'll give you, I'm going to read each of them. Here's the first one. It's found in Luke 7, 36 through 39. Here's what Luke writes. When one of the Pharisees, a Pharisee was a religious believer of the day that was a Jew. They were kind of the ruling class of the Jewish party. When one of the Pharisees, his name was Simon, by the way, invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. So you see this picture? Here's the Pharisee, a religious leader of the day. He knows Jesus. He's got an idea of who Jesus is. What he's, he knows kind of the what of Jesus, kind of what people are saying about him. And he says, come to my house. Jesus comes to his house, reclines at the table. Verse 37. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Jesus is here standing. A woman comes up. The writer identifies, says she's got a sinful life. She starts to uh, wash Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, that's intimacy. That's intimacy. And Jesus allowed it, which means he gave reciprocating intimacy to her. When the Pharisee, Simon, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, prophet meaning a person from God, if this man were a person from God, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. See, here's what he thought that day, that God is against sinners. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the arrogance of this man, but his thought was, as a religious leader, God is against sinful people. If he would have known who was washing his feet with her hair, he would have rejected her and kept her away. See, because God is against sinners. That's what he thought. And apparently, almost all the other Pharisees did at that time period. God is against sinful people. That's one story that I read. Second one, found in John 9, 1 through 2, talking about Jesus. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples, which were his followers, the 12 apostles, you're aware, asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You get this? Walking along. Jesus says, look, there's a person blind from birth. The rabbis, I mean, the disciples, the ones that followed him, immediately went to this. Well, who sinned? Is he blind because his parents did something, his mom did something, his dad did something, or is he blind because he did something? Implication, God zaps people. He's against them. You did something, he zaps you. That's the implication. And if you don't think that, I think it hits closer to home and in today's culture, maybe now more so than ever. You ever miscarry? Did you ever think, what did I do? 
You ever have somebody die? Like bury a kid? A brother or sister before time? What? What? Why? Why does this happen? See, I think I could go on and on. And I think 2,000 years ago, all of his apostles, the ones that followed him, when they saw somebody like that, their thought was, well, God's against him. He zapped him. That's what he did. And I'm not so sure that so many of us today think that as well. God is against sinners. So he, he nails them. Well, the third story is this. Then Peter came to Jesus. You know Peter, the apostle, popular. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Implication. Well, I know who you are, Jesus, and you represent God, so God gets fed up with people doing the same thing over and over again, doesn't he? He has a limit, doesn't he? Like there's an expiration date. Like the guy that keeps drinking the bottle. I mean, there's a time where God says, okay, that's it, I'm done with you. I'm rejected. I, I, I'll, re, I'll forgive you this many times, but that's it. Implication, you have an expiration date with God with your sin. That's the implication. And that's said from Peter. The woman at the well, sinful people, can't be around. Uh, God rejects them. The person that was uh, born blind, God zaps them. The person... Uh, of Peter says, you only forgive somebody seven times and then it's over with because that's how God is. He's just got limited mercy and limited grace. And here's the big point that I want to tell you. When people think that God's against them, against, against can lead to some real foggy thoughts about people and certainly about God. Against can, read, can lead to some real foggy thoughts. I'll give you an example. In my house, I live on a corner lot. Right across the street from maybe here to the screen there, 30 or 40 feet, I have a pond. A pond. It's about the size of maybe one and a half times the size of this room. And every year, you're being from St. Louis, every year, you know, it gets cold enough for a couple days a year where you know the, the, the ice is thick enough that you can skate on it every single year. And uh, so since I live next to the pond, I'm over there feeding fish all the time. We use that pond a lot. It's great. I know when it's right. Now, it's not right all the time because the pond will get frozen under, they get snow on it. Then you can't skate on it as well. It's not good ice. But we, I go over there, and I grew up where we skate over there pretty regularly when I had a son. Now, in my mind, those days were phenomenal. In reality, after about 10 minutes, my ankle hurts. I wanted to go inside, take off my skates, and go in by the fire, right? But the kids skated. Now, here's a weird deal. So we do that every time we get the chance to do that. Now I have grandchildren, and they're six and four, and their dad's a hockey guy. They're playing hockey right now. So I'm so excited about having pond hockey. If you're a hockey guy, and I say the word pond hockey, that almost makes you salivate, because it's, you know, oh, I get to go play pond hockey. So I can't wait to have my grandkids go skate on this ice. Just one problem, one problem. Our trustees put signs around the pond on each front, back, side, side, that says no swimming, no skating, right? And I understand that. So for the past eight years when I've gone skating on the pond, <laughs> I've had a policeman show up and tell me somebody has called and has reported you skating on the pond and do you know this is private property? I said, yes, I know it's private property. I live right there. He says, I'm not trying to be hard on you or anything. He says, I'm just letting you know you're going to have to get off the ice. So sure enough, I get off the ice. Like a good pastor, when he leaves, I go back on the ice. <laughs> here's, here's the point I want you to get. I know the lady trustee that calls the police on me all the time. And I don't know much about the lady. But I do know she's against me skating. That's what I know about her. You know what? She's against me skating. Now I ask you a question. Do you think I like her? I'm a pastor. <laughs> Do you think I like her? No. No, I don't like her at all. I know what she stands against. I'm not sure what she stands for. And I don't like that. That's how people are against us as Christians. 
They know what you stand against. And that's maybe why they don't like God. And maybe why they don't like your church. Against is weak. And we got to stop that. Against is weak. You don't like that. Now, you know what? If, if I met the woman, she may have very good reason for depriving my grandchildren of their greatest happiness and joy. <laughs> Against isn't right. God sent Jesus down and said, they got to understand something. I'm not against them. I'm for them. I'm for them. And let me just go back to those three stories. You know that sinful woman where the guy's thinking he must not be a prophet of God because if he knew, he wouldn't let this woman do that. Jesus knew every single sin of that woman. And he was intimate with her. He was for her. He loved her. Why would she be crying? Because she knew her sin, and she knew he didn't reject her, and she knew he came for her, and she knew he loved her. She had heard that much about Jesus, that he was for her, and it caused her tears. I don't know about some of you, but some of these songs this weekend, I've cried because I've realized that God is for me. He knows everything about me, my brokenness, my thoughts, my wish I could have, would have, should have, and he's for me. And that gal, he told her, he says, I know you know who I am. He says, your sins are forgiven. And I think the Pharisee's jaw dropped. Well, you know that blind man? When they asked, whose sin was it? Was it mom and dad's or was it just this guy? That's why he's, he says neither. We'll talk about that later in this series. For it's neither. And Jesus says, I don't do that. God doesn't zap. That's the God you might have ran away from. That's never been the real God. I understand you run away from that God. He's not real. That's not the one. Seven times seven. He says, hey, Dad, Jesus, should I forgive seven times? That's pretty good, isn't it? She says, no, Peter. It's 70 times seven, meaning it's over and over again. First of all, if you don't forgive, it'll bind you. But secondly, my father has unlimited forgiveness. You hit that bottle a million times, he'll forgive you a million times. You put that in the body a million times, he'll forgive you. You sleep in the wrong bed, he'll forgive you. Now, sin has consequences, and he wants us to live a full life. But the consequence isn't that God loves you less, and he's for you less. That is not it. I'm so tired of hearing people say, if I went to your church, if I went to church, God would strike me dead. You don't know what I've done. That is bad theology. That is foggy theology. That is not true. God is for you, the sinner, me, the sinner. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no, what, no matter what clinic you went to, no matter what happened, he is for you. And he told Jesus, you've got to go down there and show this. Because if they think I'm against, they'll, reach, they'll run from me, and I love them. So then I read these verses. Amazing verses. Romans 8, 31 through 32. Paul writes this to the church in Rome. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. The woman at the well, the blind person, the broken person, for all of us. What should I say that if God is for us, does it really make a difference if God is for us? Does it make a difference if other people aren't? If God is for us, that's a game changer. And maybe you've walked away from God because you thought he was against you, and he never was. That was a false God. That was a myth. That was a ghost. I would have walked away from that God too. He's for us. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am convinced, Paul goes on, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers. I'm getting fired up as I read this. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing you do, nothing ever created, nothing ever brought to bear on this earth will be able to separate you from the love of God as shown through Jesus Christ. And that should require an and amen. Amen. That's the truth. It is the truth. Paul got it. 
He says, there's nothing. God's for you. John 3, 17, two of my favorite verses, and I'm reading it in backwards order. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You get this? God wasn't saying, hey, you know what? Man, they're really living lousy lives. Jesus, Holy Spirit, you got to go down there. You got to condemn these guys. You got to make them feel like crud. You got to zap them. You got to tell them, look, I only got so much patience with you. Then I'm walking away. Uh uh-uh. uh. For God did not send a son of the world to condemn the world, but to save you. God loves you, He's for you. He will always be for you. He will always be. He's just. He is just. He's merciful. But this is why Jesus came. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I could go on. For God did not send the son of the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For God so loved the world. I want us to read it in a different way, out loud together, with your outdoor voice, you know, the kind of voice where you're calling the kids in to eat, all right? I want us to say, when I say, for God so loved the world, I want you to say, for God so loved me, because that's the truth. Ready? Outside voices. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. That's Easter. That's Easter. That's why he came. For is more powerful than against. For is more powerful than against. Now I'm going to speak to our church. If we don't get the language away from against, back to for where God wants it, we will lose this generation to Christ. Can I say it again? If people only know what you as a follower of Christ stand against, they will not want your Jesus or your God or mine. We have to change the conversation. A year and a half, I started thinking about this deeply. Started hearing some other pastors where I felt that God was maybe doing something in people's hearts. It is true. Against is weak. That woman that is against me skating, until I can know her for, I won't want anything to do with her. For is more powerful than against. And as a church, we've got to change this. I tell you what, Oak Bridge City, I'm so, when they started, when God put that one into play, when we just followed along and all of you guys supported and helped it, we thought, okay, we got an old church and it looks like a traditional church. Beautiful. But it doesn't look like this church. This church doesn't look like really a church. And, uh, we knew we had a big wall of, of, of where the gym is at behind it, but there's a big wall, and we knew that people would see it all along Watson Road and through the city area. So I thought, well, what should we put on that? Should we put our big logo, a big Oak Ridge logo? Maybe drop a cross there. That's what we should do. And then one of the ladies came up, and she said, one of the gals that was working on it, she said, I got an idea. She said, Tom, would this be what you're thinking about? And she showed it. And I said, that's perfect. This is what they end up putting on a wall that's 40 foot high, that's about 30 feet, that everybody sees. Look at this. Isn't that phenomenal? Show another one. If we can get that community, that group of people to understand, we're for you, God's for you. He is for you and we're for you and we're for our community. I think people will like Easter. And I think they understand the why behind it. Why God sent his son. We have these t-shirts. And uh, these t-shirts are for two reasons. One, for you to remind yourself. When you think God's against you, when you've missed your own mark of behavior, when you think God's against you, that you see this t-shirt and you remind yourself, no, no, that's not true. God is for me. His love has no ends. There's nothing that stops it. There's nothing that can separate it. Nothing can thwart it. Not demons, not angels, nothing. God loves me. And you can remember that. But secondly, 
there will be somebody, I promise you that if you wear this, that asks, what's, what's that word for? What, what is that about? And then you can say, well, God's for me. And I don't know anything about you, but he's for you too. And who knows, God may do something with that. Maybe that's all you need to say. But we've ordered thousands of these. So you can wear them. So we can start to get this word out that God is for us. He's not against us. Amen. Amen. That. That's why we celebrate the empty tomb. It's proof that God is for us, each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Last thing. God does not want something from us. He wants something. Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for Easter. We thank you that your son came. When people thought that you were against us, Jesus was the total proof of that's 100% wrong. You could not be more for us than to put your own son, to sacrifice your own son in our place and to have him mercifully and powerfully rise from the grave victorious over our sin and our shame. Father, we thank you for that. Help us never to forget this. God, I pray for the person that's in this room that came today with a bit of a hard heart and a justified heart of thinking that, God, you're against them. But it was a, it, it was a hazy, a foggy thought. It wasn't real. Father, may their eyes be open more now. To start to understand that you're for them. Through the brokenness, through the highs, through the lows, you're for them. You'll never leave them. God, may this series, this next eight weeks, be a holy time for each of us. I pray that many in this room will come back again and give you another chance. Father, I thank you for your son, proof of your love. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. With that said, we get to sing one more powerful song to the God who's with us and he's for us. Outside voice. Let's go. Ready? Amen.
good day to be here? Good day. Uh, I'm going to let you out of here. I just got three things I, I really want to go over before you close out of here. First of all, go ahead and bring the house lights up real quick for this, if you will. I want you to look at somebody next to you and say, God is for you. Tell them that. Now, you know, when I say that, I know some of you have said something to people that you know a lot about them. And you know they've taken the path to the right when they should have gotten straight a lot of times. And you know they're struggling with something right now. And they probably don't like it any more than you do. And you know it's not good for them, it's not good for your family, it's not good for your community, it's not good for God. You know who that person is? It's every one of us. Every single one of us. Something. Now I want you to look at that person again that you know, and I want you to say with all sincerity, no, really, God is for you. Now that, that, Jesus didn't want something from you. He wanted something for you, and he gave you Jesus. That's what you need to accept and trust him. That's the grace. That's the Easter story. Amazing. We've got four different stations. You can get T-shirts out there. Herc had the light gray one. I had the dark gray one. The dark gray one probably looks better than hers. <laughs> Here's really where I want to end. I normally have try and come up with a catchy phrase to have you guys remember. So you can carry through your week if you can't remember the Bible verse, the Romans verse, or the John, then you can catch it. So here's the catchy phrase. Ready? God's for yous. Yous. Say it after me. God's for yous. And let's go blues. Have a happy Easter. See you guys later. Thanks.